a great like hype man. I mean, he's got a lot of good energy. I, I wish he followed me around in the mornings, you know. We're going to get out of bed. Yeah, you know. <laughs> Who brushed their teeth? I did, you know. It would really get my mornings going, uh, you know, a lot better. So anyway, today I am really, really looking forward to today. And I think that what we're going to talk about today ties in really, really well with the communion that we're going to take um, at the end of the service here. And, and that's something that I'm looking forward to because I believe that a lot of us here in the room today are going to be able to take communion from a different place spiritually and, and from a, a, a different kind of place in your heart. So I think there's going to be something uh, that's been set free in you this morning. And you're going to have a, a different experience with communion than you've had before. So today we are talking about forgiveness. And, and this sermon's called God's Great Gamble because he kind of gambles on us when he gives us that forgiveness. And we'll get more into that. But, but today's about forgiveness. And, and this is definitely something that we all deal with. And, and I know right now in this room that there's people in here right now that I could say, like, hey, you've got somebody that you need to forgive, and you would, you know, you're looking at me saying, nope, not doing it. I'm, I'm absolutely, this is not my Sunday. I'm going to switch off right now. I'm going to think about other things. But, but listen, this, this is important. It's really important for you, and really important for those that need to forgive you, and those people that you need to forgive. So, as we talk about this today, I want to start by just asking. You the, this question is how, how many of us, and hopefully this is all of us. How many of us have actually forgiven somebody before they even asked for it? So, so somebody's done something to you, and you've said, you know what? I'm just going to forgive them. Uh, they've not asked for forgiveness, but I'm just going to go ahead and do it. And, and better yet, there's some of us, and I, I've done this a few times, where you forgive somebody, and they haven't asked for it, and then you don't tell them that they've been forgiven. And, and if you've done that, that, that's okay. You know, maybe somebody's done something that's really, really hurt you quite badly. You, you may not need to forgive them and then go running to them and say, hey, hey, I forgave you. Because they may say, well, who cares? And then you've got to forgive them again. You've got more hurts that have been opened back up and say, well, what do you mean? You know, like you did this, you know, so, so sometimes we just, we have a hurt and then we just forgive. And then we don't, tell people that we've forgiven, and, and that's okay. And, and on the rare occasion, that person that we've forgiven, that we did not tell that we forgave, will come to us, and they'll say, hey, man, I just really need to apologize. I just really need you to know that I'm, I'm sorry. You know, I'm sorry that, that I did this thing that hurt you. And, and you get to say, if, if you're mature, if you're like me, you may say, ha, you know, I'm glad you realized it. I'm glad you finally realized that you owe me this. But if you're more mature than that, then you may say, okay, fantastic. You know what? I've already forgiven you. The for you, you already forgave you. I forgave you as soon as you did it. As soon as I walked away from that conversation, I forgave you. And, and that brings up something that I feel like is, is really important here, is that there's two things at play here. There's forgiveness, and then there's restoration, so if you forgive somebody before they know that they've been forgiven, yes, you've forgiven them, but that relationship has not been restored or reconciled. See, forgiveness does not automatically mean restoration or reconciliation. There's still work that needs to be done after forgiveness has happened. But restoration, reconciliation, that can only come when there's been forgiveness. So it's important that we kind of distinguish between the two of those, that there's forgiveness and then there's restoration that happens through that. Now the vehicle that takes us from, and that this, is, this is the important part of our setup here for today's message, the thing that takes you from forgiven to restored is acknowledgement. So that, that, that's the moment where I have forgiven you for hurting me and you have come to me and you've said, hey, I'm really sorry that I hurt you. I'm acknowledging that I made a mistake and that I hurt you. Now, all of a sudden, the forgiveness that I've already given turns into restoration or reconciliation because they have acknowledged that they hurt me or they did me wrong. So that, that's important. Those two things are forgiveness is different from reconciliation, but the, the difference between the two is acknowledgement. Now, for those of us that... Um, as I talk about forgiveness today, 
Like I said at the beginning, there's going to be some of us that are going to say, I'm absolutely not going to forgive this person. I want everybody to kind of picture in your mind a situation that you've not forgiven somebody for. And we all have them. I've, I've got them. As I was preparing for this sermon, I thought, man, there's people still in my life that I have not forgiven them for some of the things that they've done. Now, is, this isn't me because I'm very happily married and happy with, uh, with the course that my life took that took me to my, my wife, who I love very much. But some of you may be a little bit, bit bitter over like an ex-girlfriend or an ex-boyfriend. And then now it's 30 years on and you're still looking back and you're still upset with them. You're still uh, you know, hurting because of the relationship that you had with them. Or it may be um, a work-related issue. Really, the big ones are, are family. It's really easy to forgive coworkers. It's really, really, really hard to forgive and let go of family. And what's even better, or actually worse with family, is that we cannot forgive them and just pretend and continue to you know, meet them twice a year for Sunday dinner. We can see them at Christmas and Easter, and everything's fine. And then when you walk away and you get in the car and you shut the car door, you're like, man, I hate Uncle Ted. You know, I'm so glad we're out of there. Not, not Ted, Ted, Ted. For those of you that don't know Ted, Ted Myrtle Ted, he is a gem, and we do not hate him at, at all. In fact, Ted speaks scripture over me. He's got the majority of the New Testament memorized, and when he, when he speaks that scripture over me, it's quite amazing. So, Ted, we, we love you. But you guys all have those family members who you get in the car and you're like, I'm so glad that I'm out of there. Well, I've got some advice for you today. I, I really want to give you this, this advice. And the, the, the advice is just, for, just forgive that person. Like, just, just do it. You've got two options. You know, think about the relationship or the person that you've not forgiven or the situation. You have two options. Option number one, you don't forgive them. And you may be sitting there saying, well, you know what? You don't understand what they did to me. And that's true. They may not deserve forgiveness. And, and you probably didn't deserve what happened to you. But if you don't let go of that, if you don't forgive them, then th th that has control over you. It has power over you for the rest of your life or until you do forgive them. You know, the second option is that you just you forgive. That doesn't mean that you have to automatically assume the relationship is restored. You don't have to go back to being best friends. You don't have to call them you know, and say, hey, man, I just want you to know that I've forgiven you and I love you. No, you don't have to do any of that. But, but in your heart, you can forgive them because it can then set you free from that hurt, that pain that you've been carrying for so, so long. And so today, that, that's kind of what we're talking about is that ability to forgive and specifically the ability to forgive when you haven't, when they haven't asked for it. Now, when it comes to forgiveness, I, I want to address those of us that are struggling with the idea of forgiving a person or a situation that has hurt you. And if we look in Matthew, there's a, a, a narrative there in Matthew where we hear from Peter. Now, Peter is having a conversation with Jesus. Now, what I'm going to do with this verse right here is I'm going to dismantle and take away from you every self-entitled right that you think that you have to hold a grudge and to not forgive somebody. We're just going to take that away. And so you no longer, after we read this verse, have the right or the ability or the entitlement to hold the grudge that you've been holding on to. Now, as those words leave my own mouth... In my head, I'm also thinking, because I'm trying to do two things at once. I'm thinking that I am a hypocrite and a liar. Because even though I'm about to read this and I'm about to take away our right and our ability to hold a grudge, I know for a fact that there are relationships that I'm, that I'm not just going to be like, okay, well, that's done. I just forgive those people. Now, you're still going to have to put some work in. You're still going to have to do something about that. You get to work on yourself, work on your heart. So I don't want to minimize that. This is not a, I've read a verse and now all of a sudden all forgiveness is for everybody and we're all good and no one is allowed to struggle with forgiving people. No one is allowed to struggle through what it takes to forgive somebody. I, that, that's not what I'm saying here. But what I am saying is that Jesus spells it out very clearly the way that forgiveness is supposed to work. And here's what he says to Peter. Peter comes in 
And he asks them a, a, a great question. Peter's learning how to be like Jesus. They're learning how to be disciples. And he comes to, to Jesus and he says, How many times will my brother sin against me and I forgive him and let it go? Because, you know, that makes sense. There should be a, a limit to that. You know, you sin against me once. Okay, I forgive you twice. All right, I forgive you again three times. Yeah, we're starting to push the boundaries a little bit. You know, there's a saying that I, I shouldn't even say because I don't know all of it, but it's uh, do me wrong once, shame on you. Do me wrong twice, shame on me. It goes something along those lines. You know, so, so Peter's kind of coming with that attitude. Of how many times should we actually forgive somebody? And this is where Jesus just destroys all of us with this here. Jesus says, okay, so here's how many times that you should forgive, Peter. And he goes on in the next verse here, and he says, Jesus answered him, I say to you, not up to seven times, but 70 times seven. Now, that does not mean that everyone pulls out a calculator and does the math, okay, and says, all right, you know, and then you keep a little note on your phone, and every time that person does something wrong or hurts you, you just put up, you just put, you just keep you know, uh, you just, there's an app, there's several apps that are, are, are uh, counting apps. You just push a button and it just keeps a tally of something. So we, we don't all need to download those and then title uh, people's names as those tallies and then just push that button. And then when you get to a certain number, you're like, all right, now I no longer have to forgive you. What Jesus is implying here with this 70 times 7 is Jesus is implying that for, actually forgiveness is limitless. So that's the moment there where, where through what Jesus is teaching Peter, he takes away from us any right, any entitlement that we have and that we carry to hold a grudge or to not forgive somebody. And I realize that this is hard. You know, I, I, I realize that, I, that, that this can be easy in some situations and nearly impossible in other situations. I listen to a lot of uh, true crime podcasts. I don't know if we've got any other, like, true crime fans out there. Thank you, sir. Yeah, there's a couple of us. You know, the rest of you are just ashamed of it and you're hiding it. Because that stuff is like a drug. You just listen to it. And, and when I think about some of the things on there, I mean, you've got, how, how does a parent forgive somebody that's hurt a child? Or, or how, does, how does a parent forgive somebody that, that has hurt a, a, a spouse, a husband that's had a spouse be hurt? You know, there's these horrific things that happen to us. And that happens because of sin. And when these things happen, how are we supposed to then look at the person that's done us so wrong? Look at them maybe even in jail or wherever it is and say, hey, I forgive you. Now, I, I, I'm saying all this to let you know that even though the Bible says this, and even though Jesus says this, I want to give you permission for this to be hard. Because if I stand up here and I say, this shouldn't be hard. Claim what the Bible says, claim it, name it, and go on with it. Then, then I'm already being a hypocrite. And I'm already telling you a lie. Because this is incredibly, incredibly hard. But it's true. And so if you think about that Jesus is telling the disciples and telling us. So he says take you through a logical train of thought here. Jesus says, forgiveness is limitless. You're supposed to always just continue to forgive people. And then he says, later, he says, I'm teaching you these things because I want you to become like me. And Jesus also says in the, in the Bible, he says that he is like the Father. He says, if you know me, then you know my Father. And so if Jesus is teaching us to have limit, unlimited forgiveness... And then he's teaching us to be like him. And he is a representation of God. Then that makes me wonder, is God like that? Is God a God that has unlimited forgiveness for us? Now see, we, we, we better hope that he does. Because otherwise we could hit that, that number that you put in your calculator 70 times 7. We could hit that real fast. And if God is as powerful as he is, and he's, he's omnipotent, and he's, he's everywhere, and he's just in, in everything, and he's all around, then I promise, if he wanted to, he's, he's not skipping that button, that tally. He's counting every sin, every thought, every bad thing. Every time I get in the car and I say, thank God I'm away from this person, he's, it's Chris, there's one, there's another, you know. 
our, our four-year-old would already be done. I, actually, the, the majority of us won't even make it to the age of five. And so I, I, I hope that God is like that. I hope that God offers us limitless forgiveness, absolutely unlimited forgiveness. And I, I do believe that he does. And today we're going to talk through three different narratives. And these three narratives are going to show you how God operates around forgiveness. And it's going to help you find your place in God's forgiveness. So the first one that we're going to look at today is you've got Jesus. Jesus shows up to a house. And he's been on the road, he's been teaching, and he's developed quite a reputation. And this reputation that he has is that Jesus is a healer. And Jesus, as a healer, he, you know, he finds people and they come to him and, and he's healed the blind, he's healed the sick, he's turned water into wine. He's done all of these things and he's built this reputation. So, so the town finds out that Jesus is going to be coming to a home and so everyone shows up to it. And everyone packs into this house and Jesus starts to teach. And because so many people are packed into the house and so many people are overflowing out of the house, there, there's no way for there to be any wiggle room, or there, there to be any room for this other character, this special man and his friends, to make their way into the home where Jesus is. So what they do, and many of you know this, this story, is, is they walk up onto the roof of the house, and the roofs of these houses were made with, with mud and hay and kind of thatch and all that stuff. And they walk up on the roof of the house, and they start tearing the roof apart. And if you put yourself in the room, you know, you've got Jesus who's teaching and then maybe dirt, you know, a speck of dirt falls. And Jesus is like, I'm going to ignore that because I'm in the moment here. I feel like I've got the crowd's, you know, attention. So, and then more dirt starts to fall. And then he sees in the crowd dirt falling on other people. And they're trying not to be, you know, awkward and trying not to, to look up and see what's happening. Everyone, you guys ever been in a situation where uh, some, there's a baby crying in the room and you're just trying, you're just ignoring it. And you're just powering through that conversation. Now, I can imagine that this is what that's like, but eventually the roof breaks open completely and this man gets lowered down on a cot and he gets put right in front of Jesus. And so here he is, lowered down, the crowd stops, Jesus stops, and he looks down at this guy and this is the first thing that Jesus says. He says this in Luke here. He says, when Jesus saw their act of faith because they were confident in Jesus' power to heal. He said, man, your sins are forgiven. Now, I, I like to wonder about, this is not a spiritual thing, but man, your sins are forgiven. See, the, the Amplified Bible works off the New American Standard Bible translation, which is really close to being literal word for word. And so when it says here, man, I wonder what kind of inflection was in Jesus' tone. Was it like a Musenberg vibe, like a, what's up, man? Your sins are forgiven, you know? Let's go surf. You know, or is it, very, is it like a very, you know, stern thing where it's like, man, your sins are forgiven. I don't know what that's like. But what I do know is that the very first thing that Jesus says is, hey, buddy. That's how I would say it. I'd be like, hey, buddy, your sins are forgiven. Now, th this guy is not even asked for forgiveness. See, now, now we're going to start unpacking this and how it applies to us. He has not asked for forgiveness. They actually brought him to get healing, not forgiveness. And Jesus, the first thing he does before this man has even asked him for forgiveness, he says, hey, buddy, I forgive you. Now, as this is happening, the scribes and the Pharisees, and we see in this in verse 21, the scribes and the Pharisees around, and these are the Jewish leaders. These are the religious leaders of the day. They're around and they begin to consider and question what he's saying. Basically, they're saying, like, wait a minute. Did he just say that this guy's sins are forgiven? Because if so, that's a big deal. That's a really, really big deal. And they say, who is this man who speaks blasphemies? Because he's claiming the rights and prerogatives of God. They're like, Jesus is actually claiming 
that he has the ability of God, which is to forgive sins. And they're looking around and they're saying, do we see a temple here? No. Do we see burnt sacrifice and offering here? No. Do we see someone who's been made clean and is able to enter the temple? No. We see a dirty, paralyzed man laying on a mat with no temple, with no sacrifice, with nothing in place, nothing in order that would lead to God forgiving this person. And all they see is Jesus, who they think is an impersonator, look at this guy and say, your sins are forgiven. So they're really rattled by this. And then the the story goes on in the next verse and says, who can forgive sins? That is guilty. Uh, Who can nullify sin's penalty? Who can assign righteousness to a person? Isn't that beautiful? The idea of forgiving a sin, it's removing guilt. It's nullifying the penalty of sin. It's assigning righteousness to a person. Only God alone can do that. Not not Jesus. Not this guy in this house here. You can't just willy-nilly say, boom, there you are, there you plop, your sins are forgiven. And so Jesus here, he 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 knows what they're talking, he knows what they're thinking. And so Jesus in verse 22, he says. Jesus, knowing their hostile thoughts, he answered them. Why are you questioning these things in your heart? So Jesus, he he can, you got to be careful what you think about when you're around Jesus in the New Testament because he could actually, you know, hear your thoughts. He knew what was going on in your heart. That's still true today. But it's a whole lot, you know, easier to disconnect from that because he's not standing directly in front of you. Now, I can prove this to you because a lot of you mothers out there you know exactly what your child is about to do before they actually do it. You know what's going on in their head, and you know what's going on in their heart. You tell them to do something, and you know that that kid is not going to do what I've asked him to do. Instead, he's going to do this other thing. That, it's it's that, that mother's intuition, but on like a, in an exponential ability and scale. So Jesus knows what they're thinking. And so then he, he kind of asks them this question here. It's a loaded question, but it proves our point here. He says... Which is easier to say? So he's looking at these guys. Paralyzed man on the floor. And he looks around at the Pharisees and he says, What's easier? Should I is it easier for me to say your sins are forgiven? Or for me to say, Hey, I want you to get up and walk? Well, obviously, it's easier to say your sins are forgiven because there's nothing physical that would change there. And he knows that by asking them that question, they would say, well, you know, it's a lot easier for you to say that someone's sins are forgiven because then they can continue to lay on the mat. You could be a great televangelist and say, okay, come forward, you know, lay hands on you, your sins are forgiven, camera cuts away, the lights go down, a bunch of people run on stage, scoop the guy up, they take him off to the side, lights come back up, oh, the man walked away, it's amazing, it's like a magic trick. It's a whole lot easier to say your sins are forgiven than it is to say, hey, stand up. So, now that they've answered that question, Jesus goes on here in verse 24. He says, but in order that you may know that the Son of Man, me, the Messiah, Jesus has titled himself the Son of Man, he has authority and power on earth to forgive sins. Jesus has authority and power to forgive sin." And he said to the paralyzed man, I say to you, get up, pick up your stretcher, and go home. And after that happened in in the the end of this chapter here in, in verse 26, they were all astonished. And they began glorifying God, and they were filled with reverential fear, and they kept saying, we have seen wonderful and incredible things today. Yeah, it would be wonderful and incredible. I wonder what was wonderful and incredible. The fact that Jesus stood up to the Pharisees, Or the fact that this man got up and picked up his mat and he walked away. See, Jesus heals in the physical so that we can understand that Jesus is able to forgive us in the spiritual. See, Jesus uses in this situation and many, many more, he uses healing, which is something that people can see to prove and show that he can also do the work in the spiritual, in the heart. So he says, guys, what's easier, saying that they're forgiven or healing? They say, well, it's way easier to say that they're forgiven. So Jesus does the harder one. And he says, okay, you've seen me do the harder one. So now you need to know and trust that I have the authority to forgive sin on my own, at my will, 
without it being prompted and without it being asked for. And so then a few days later, we look at our our second narrative. Jesus finds himself in in the home of a man named Simon. And Simon was a Pharisee. And Simon decided that he's going to have a a big banquet. And the purpose of this banquet was to gather a whole bunch of people. And and they would open the doors and open the windows. This is something that I learned about this. I thought was pretty interesting. It was a big open house. And, And the reason for that is that so people could kind of come and they could gather and they could have conversations and converse and talk to each other and they could listen to other conversations and they could kind of kind of rub elbows with each other. And so they've invited Jesus to this. And the whole point is that a bunch of people are going to have the opportunity to talk to and ask Jesus questions. And he's hoping that Jesus will slip up and do or say something wrong. And then they'll be able to pin him and say, Ha, you are a heretic. You're not a prophet. You're not who you say that you are. So they're going to try and trap Jesus. And so while he's sitting there, while Jesus is there and he's, and he's talking... And he's, he's hanging out with people. And they're asking him questions and stuff. Something really, really significant happens. There's a lady that walks in off the street. And she kind of comes in, you know, sits to the back. Because she was unclean. And if she was caught in this house, not only would she be forcefully removed and punished, but they would have to cleanse the entire house. And they would have to cleanse every person in the house. Because now that environment would be made unclean and they would not be able to go to the temple and get forgiveness from God for their sins. So this lady boldly sneaks in here. And while Jesus is sitting there teaching and talking, he feels something happening at his feet. And what's happening is this woman has come forward with courage and she has just broken down into tears, crying. And I like to think that she's having an encounter with the Spirit of God. And she knows how sinful she's been. She knows that she's a a known sinner in their community. She knows that about herself. She knows that her identity is one of, I'm unclean, I'm unforgivable, I'm a sinner. And she just has this breakdown. And she starts crying. And she's at the feet of Jesus, in a position of submission to Him. And her tears wash Jesus' feet. And she uses her hair to dry his feet and to clean his feet off. And she has perfume that's in an alabaster jar. And that alabaster is like a a softer material which would preserve the perfume. And, And she breaks that open and pours it over him. And she's just pouring out everything that she has for him. Giving him her her genuine heart and soul. And then giving him something that would have been so valuable which is that bottle of perfume. And when that happens... That incredibly sensitive moment, when that happens, that's when these Pharisees say, Aha, there's no way that you can be a prophet. There's no way that you can be the Son of God. And here's why. Simon, he invited Jesus, he sees this, and he says to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him. That she is a notorious sinner. See, they're saying, Jesus, if you're really the Son of God, then you would know that this unclean woman is at your feet. And you would do what we're supposed to do. You would kick her out and punish her. Because she's now made everything unclean. And so Jesus, when he hears this, and he knows that Simon's thinking about this, Jesus tells a, a, a parable. And in this parable, he talks about a money lender. And this money lender has two people that owe him money. One person owes a a little bit of money, maybe like a month's wages worth, and the other person owes about a year's worth of of wages to the money lender. Money lender decides to do something that we would hope would happen in our lives one day, but probably never ever will. The money lender says, I'm just going to cancel their debt. And, And when he cancels the debt, he asks Simon this question. And he says this, he says, When they had no means of repaying the debts, he freely forgave them both. So, he asked Simon, Which one of them will love him more? Who, who, we could take a poll in here. Who would love the money lender the most in this room? And the same answer that would apply here is what applies here. And Simon reluctantly has to give that answer. And so he he says to Jesus, he looks at him and he says, 
The one that I take it, okay, fine, I see where you're going with this, Jesus. I, I guess if I had to say that the person that had more to be forgiven for is the one that loved him the most. And when Jesus hears that, Jesus does this really peculiar thing. He looks down at the woman. He's not even looked at her yet. He looks at the woman, but he continues talking to Simon. And he's just brought up this, 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 uh, this idea to Simon of, hey, who's going to love the money lender the most when their debt is canceled? And he's looking at this woman who knows that she owes the greatest debt because she's unclean, she's a sinner, she's notorious for being that way. And Jesus is looking down at her, but he's talking to Simon. And as he's looking at her, look at what he says to Simon here. He says this in the next verse. He says, then turning toward the woman, he says to Simon, do you see this woman? Do you see her? You know, if I put myself in that position, how many of us, because of how sinful we know that we are, we feel that God does not see us? Because we feel like we're unqualified to be seen. We feel like that God isn't going to answer our prayers because look at all the sin that I committed this week. We feel like that God is not going to forgive us. He's not going to love us. That we're not going to be blessed by Him because I know what I did this week. I know what I looked at online. I know what pills I took. I know how much alcohol I drank. I know how I talked to my mom or my dad. I know exactly how I talked to my kids. I know how I acted at work. You know, I know, and this is, I know how I spoke to my F&B banker this week because they would not release a, a, a wire to me. You know, we, we have these things in our life where, okay, I know how I was. And because I know that, there's no way that God sees me. He can't see me. He can't hear my prayers. In fact, I want to hide myself from him. And so when Jesus says, do you see this woman He's saying, no, you don't see this woman because you see nothing but a pile of sin. But I, Jesus, I see her. And let me show you what I actually see. So Jesus says, I came into your house, Simon, but you failed even to give me the courtesy that you would show to a guest. You were rude to me. He says, you gave me no water for my feet, which would have been a very common custom. It was clear that Jesus was brought in to be brought down. He says, you didn't give me water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair, which demonstrated her love. And then in verse 45, he goes on to say, you gave me no welcoming kiss, no greeting, no handshake, no, hey, buddy, how's it going? I just walked right in and jumped into the pit of vipers that you all are. And he says, but from the moment that I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not even anoint my head with ordinary oil, but she has anointed my feet with costly and rare perfume. Now, Jesus, the next thing he says, he's still looking at the woman. He's still talking to Simon. He says, therefore, I say to you, Simon, who's, I, I don't know why I think, but I think Jesus is looking down and Simon's over this shoulder for some reason. That's the way that I imagine it. And he, And he's looking at at her and he's pointing it at Simon. He says, Simon, her sins are forgiven. And I'm not denying that there are many. I'm not denying that, that she really, really is a mess up. But what I am saying is that her sins are absolutely forgiven. For she loved much. But remember that little parable that he told? Who loves the, the, the debt collector the most? Who loves the money lender the most? What's the person that had the most to be forgiven for. And so he says, For she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. See, Jesus adds that twist in there at the end to bring it back to that parable. And then finally, while he's looking at the woman, she says nothing, by the way. Nothing. She probably can't talk. She's probably so choked up and broken with with her tears and with her emotions. Jesus looks at her and he says, Your sins are forgiven. See, what we can learn from these two narratives is that the authority of Jesus begins to threaten the temple system. Because now all of a sudden, the, the, the people, they don't need the temple for forgiveness. They don't need a priest for forgiveness. The, the Pharisees are starting to watch it unfold. 
that somebody could be forgiven for a sin that they did not even ask for forgiveness for. That's the exact opposite of if you want forgiveness for your sins, you have to go through a cleansing process. You've got to buy an animal. The animal's got to be sacrificed. You've got to come to the temple in Jerusalem. You've got to go up and you've got to go through all these steps to make this sacrifice. And when that sacrifice has been made, then you can be clean before God. And you can't, make, you can't do that whole process. You need a priest to do that. And that is a system that God set up before Jesus but the, the Pharisees, they kind of manipulated that system. And they use it as a, as a division. They use it to divide you know, class. They use it to divide, uh, you know, economically divide people. It, it was a messed up system. But they needed it. They relied on it because it gave them power. And it gave them the ability to maintain the way of life that they knew about. And Jesus, in these situations, in front of the Pharisees, is undoing and unraveling that entire thing. And in fact, Jesus is teaching people this just amazing truth. Is that the fear of God can be replaced with gratitude for God. The woman at his feet, her fear can be replaced with gratitude. The man lowered down on the cot, his fear can be replaced with gratitude. Now, all of a sudden, all these people that are afraid of God and therefore they're driven to these corrupt Pharisees and priests, they're, they're no longer driven by fear. They can instead be grateful for God. See, Jesus is unraveling this whole thing. This idea of unlimited forgiveness, it's unraveling an entire culture. And so, with that being said, they, there's only one thing that they can do. The only one thing that they can do with Jesus, and they crucify him. And we see in Luke 22, verse 33, we see that when they came to the place called the skull, this is Luke talking about the account of Jesus' crucifixion. There, they crucified him, and he had two criminals, one on his right and one on his left. That was, that was the only way that they could preserve their way of life, because Jesus was getting a truth out. That forgiveness did not need to be asked for. It was already given. It was limitless. And in fact, Jesus goes on to prove this one more time. As Jesus is hanging on the cross, and he's giving his life up, and he's taking on the, the sins of the world, Jesus says something out loud. He says this. He says, and Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them. Forgive them. You are them. I am them. We are all them. Forgive them. Guess what? For they do not know what they're doing. They don't even know that they're sinning. But go ahead and forgive them. They've not asked for it. Forgive them. They've not confessed it. God, go ahead and forgive them. Without being asked, Jesus dies on the cross and gives every single person that was, is, and will be absolute forgiveness for every sin that could ever be committed. Now, I'd like to turn our attention to Paul and kind of like pause. I kind of felt like there was this moment here where we needed to pause before we talked about what Paul talks about here. And just kind of like, like uh, kind of unpack what we've learned up to this point. So for you, your takeaway up to this point is simple, and it's this. Your takeaway is, is that you may never have asked Jesus for forgiveness in your life. You've not chosen Jesus. You're not a Christ follower. You're not sure about it. You are forgiven for every sin that you could have committed, that you are committing, or that you will commit. Now, for those of you that feel disqualified because you've sinned and there's no way that God can forgive you, I want you to know that you are forgiven whether you believe it, whether you ask for it, or whether you think that you deserve it, you are already forgiven. And here's what Paul says to us, and as he's describing this to the, the, the church in, Roman, in Romans, and he says in verse 6, he says in, in 5 verse 6, he says, While we were still helpless, powerless to provide for our salvation, Paul is saying, while we were still sinners, while we were actively sinning, 
before there was even a Jesus to ask into our heart, before there was a prayer that we could pray, while we were still completely messed up as humans, as an entire human race, while we were still an absolute mess, he goes on to say, at the right time, Christ died as a substitute for the ungodly. See, Paul gets it. He was alive at the time. He knew what Jesus did. And he says, hey, let's, let's not forget this. That while we were still sinning, Christ died for us. Hey, you know what? While I am still sinning, while I was still sinning, Christ died for me. Are you starting to see that, that there's, a, that there's a, an important truth that we take away from this? And it's this, that your forgiveness has nothing to do with whether or not you recognize or accept it. It's already been done and it's already been given to you. Your forgiveness has nothing to do with you, and it has everything to do with what God has already done for you and laid out before you. There's an author, a guy named Philip Yancey, and he has a quote which is really good here, and it says this, God took a great risk by announcing our forgiveness in advance. See, God has already forgiven us. Now, I'm going to draw one conclusion here. And then we're going to move forward with, uh, with communion. Remember in the beginning when I talked about how there was a difference between forgiveness and reconciliation? Between forgiveness and restoration? So let's revisit that. You are a sinner. You sinned and you hurt God. You're a sinner and your sins put Jesus on the cross. Whether you accept it or not, your sins put Jesus on the cross. Now, God had two options. Jesus had two options. He could either stay bitter and stay mad or get bitter, get mad, and just wipe us all out, wipe all of earth and creation completely out. Or he could make a decision and take the advice that we talked about, and he could forgive. So because Jesus died for our sins and he forgave us, so we are forgiven, that does not mean that we are reconciled and restored to God. It means that we're forgiven. That's why I can look at all you sinners out there, and some of you, I'm not going to say who I'm pointing at, are really big sinners. You know, I see people getting sweaty, and they're like, is he pointing at me? Does he know? Oh, I know. I know. No, I don't. I don't know. You're safe. But God is like, hey, you're a sinner, and I've forgiven you for that, but you're not restored. See, we, we, we get the two confused. We think that I'm not reconciled, I'm not restored, I'm not even forgiven. I'm just a sinner and I'm off over here to the side. And God's going, hey, anytime you're ready, you can ask for forgiveness and I'll forgive you. And you can come over here on this side with me. But instead, what's happening is God is saying, hey, don't you know that you're already forgiven? Don't you know that that's already been done? Don't you know that when Jesus, my son, hung on the cross for you, that every sin was forgiven immediately, wiped completely out of the book? Now all you have to do is acknowledge it. And so what we're going to do this morning, and this is why it ties in so well with communion, is we're going to use acknowledgement as, as this vehicle to go from forgiven to restored. And then when you take communion this morning... You're going to get an opportunity, if you've never had it before, to take communion as a restored child of God. Because you're already forgiven. Why would you not, as a forgiven person, just go ahead and acknowledge that you were sinful? Just all you have to do is acknowledge it. God, I was a sinner. I'm so sorry. Okay, I've already forgiven you, but now you're restored. See, that's what happens when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. We accept the good news of the gospel. That good news is this. Hey, Chris, I told you you were already forgiven. Now the good news is, is that you're restored. And now there's nothing you can ever do to fall out of that state. You are restored and you're adopted as a son and a daughter into my kingdom. And so there's a prayer here that I have that we're, we're all going to pray this. And this is a prayer that we're going to pray. We're going to pray it out loud together. And I'll tell you why here in just a second. We're going to pray this prayer out loud together. 
Because it's going to give you an opportunity to accept responsibility for the sin that you've done, that you've lived in, and go from forgiven to forgiven and restored. And I know that this is really hard for people to do. It's hard for people to understand. And I know that it's, you know, it, it's a hard thing to accept. So I just figure, you know what? The best way that we can do it is that we can all say this out loud. And also, I, I'm trying to trick you. Because I believe that when we speak things, we speak things into existence. When, when we say something out loud, when we confess something with our mouth out loud, it, it, it adds more stick to it. You know, I, I can go on a, a, a diet and not tell anybody about it. And then when I don't, you know, actually do it, it doesn't matter because no one knows. But if I tell everybody that I'm on a diet and then, you know, I'm walking around with a tub of ice cream, everyone knows like, hey, man, you're not supposed to be doing that. I thought you said you were on a diet. And see, when we speak things out loud, it has power over us. Your words have power. So all you have to do is speak this. Some of you are going to believe it and you're going to grab it. Some of you aren't. And that's okay, because if you don't, my prayer is that it just plants a seed in your heart. It just, it just plants a seed. And just keep coming back to church, and we'll keep watering that seed. And one day, that seed will sprout, and you'll get it. You'll get this amazing connection that you're already forgiven. Acknowledge it, and let's be restored. So we're going to pray this prayer, and we're going to pray it together. And I'm going to say it in a nice, steady tone, and I want you guys to speak it with me. We're going to say, we're going to start like this. Heavenly Father, I'm like the man on the mat and the woman at the banquet. I need to be forgiven of my sin. I don't deserve it. I can't earn it. I believe Jesus earned it for me when he died for me. So I place my faith in him as forgiver and savior. Amen. Now I believe that somebody in this room today just got freedom. Because you went from being forgiven to restored. And so I, I'm going to say a quick prayer. And when I say amen, I'm going to invite you guys to come up to the communion stations. We've got two at the front and we, I think we've got two at the back. And grab the, the communion elements and then I'm going to quickly lead you guys through communion. But today may be somebody's first day to take communion as a restored person, not just a forgiven person. So Heavenly Father, I pray that you do only the work that you can do and that people will, will just grab onto this and they will say, you know what, I don't want to just be forgiven. I want to be forgiven and restored. So Father, we acknowledge publicly to you that we're sinners and we thank you, Father, for the work that you've already done to forgive us. In Jesus' name we pray.